What the fuck? Leatherface. Leatherface. An iconic horror movie character. Known for wearing the skin of victims as a mask to, well, depending on which movie you watch, either hide a facial deformity or to express himself because he's not able to do so. And he also terrorizes innocent teenagers with a chainsaw. Contrary to popular belief, or at least the abundance of rumors that I heard during my high school days in Texas, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie where Leatherface is a character was not inspired by any one true story of a cannibal family located somewhere in a desolate area of the state, but rather an amalgamation of multiple news stories from which writer and director Willard Hooper was inspired by while writing the movie. News stories full of graphic violence were combined with a story that he wrote about isolation and darkness as a way to describe humanity as the true monster. While it is a beaten trope in today's standards, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre drawing inspiration from the cruelty that humans inflict upon each other was a pretty novel idea in the 1970s. And while the movie wasn't inspired by only one true story, Leatherface was highly inspired by one man. One individual so sick and twisted that Leatherface is almost a comic book character's B-level villain by comparison. That man's name? Shemp Howard of the Three Stooges. No, wait. Ed Gein. Welcome to Fake History. Where the history is real, but the video isn't. Edward Theodore Gein, also known as Eddie Teddy Gein by his friends, was born in 1906 in La Crosse County, Wisconsin, to his parents, George Philip Gein and Augusta Wil Wilhelmine. Wil Wilhelmine. Fuck it, I don't know. Gein. He had one sibling an older brother named Henry George Gein. His father George was an alcoholic, unable to keep a steady job, yet somehow managed to own a grocery store without prior experience or any form of capital, and sold it for a profit, proving that the American dream has died twice. While most of us would love to have an opportunity to simply sit in a corner office, this day-drinking son of a bitch owned his own business. After selling the grocery store, which probably sucked while he owned it, George moved his family to a 155 acre farm he purchased. God damn it. So in the early 1900s, you could be a drunken man who owns his own business without prior experience and then buy 155 acres? Meanwhile, I went to college and I was lucky to get less than a quarter of an acre. Fuck it, I'm done with this bullshit. Sorry about that. Anyway, they lived on a farm and Ed Gein only left to attend school. His mother Augusta used the opportunity of isolated living to turn away any outsiders so they couldn't influence her children. This of course is totally normal and there's nothing wrong with not allowing your children to socialize. When Ed wasn't in school, he spent most of his time doing chores on the farm and listening to his mother bitch, I mean preach to her sons, as his mother was a strict Lutheran who believed that drinking, dancing, playing cards, and women were all evil, and they would cause the boys to be damned to hell for all eternity. Here's another little known fact, Ed Gein wasn't the only member of his family used as an inspiration for movies. His mother was the inspiration for the entire town of Footloose. For all of you who are under 20, go watch the movie to get that joke. And the original, not the piece of shit remake. Stop making remakes, Hollywood. Well, except for Highlander. Please, please continue to remake that one with Henry Cavill and make him as shirtless as possible. Every day his mother would read to him and his brother from the Bible. And like any good religious leader, she cherry picked the areas of the Bible she wanted and ignored the rest. In response to his upbringing, Gein was described as strange by his teachers and classmates. Most notably, he would laugh to himself as if he heard a funny joke that no one else could hear. Outside of his school, his mother would punish him when he missed chores or if he just had the audacity to make friends. Mother of the Year. In April of 1940, family patriarch George Gein would die at the age of 66 from heart failure caused by his alcoholism. Ed, who was 34 at the time, and his brother Henry began working odd jobs around the town to cover the family's expenses. The community viewed them as reliable and honest brothers to the point that Ed would frequently babysit for neighbors. It was noted that Ed seemed to relate to children more than adults, no doubt a result of his upbringing. Apparently, grown men babysitting children was normal in the 1940s, whereas today, fathers with their children are accosted in public if their mother's not around. Did we somehow move backwards? 
Around this time, George began dating a local woman and wanted to move in with her, but he worried about leaving Ed alone with her mother due to their unnatural relationship and Ed's questionable attachment to her. Henry would make this known several times to his brother, who would always respond with feelings of hurt and confusion towards him. In May 1944, Ed and Henry were burning away vegetation that had grown on the property, and the fire got out of control. Firefighters responded, but it still took the entirety of the day to get it under control. Afterwards, Ed reported his brother was missing, and a search started. Henry was found dead, face down, unburned, and bruises on his head. Even with evidence of foul play, his death was ruled a heart failure. Later on, a biographer for Ed Gein stated that his belief was Ed performed a Cain and Abel style murder on his brother, stemming from the negativity Henry portrayed towards their mother. At least the police investigation and their ineptitude haven't changed since back then. With the death of his brother and father, Ed now had his mother to himself. Soon after, Augusta suffered a stroke, causing Ed to take care of her. Now, normally, I wouldn't say this is a bad thing. After all, a lot of normal families love and care for each other. But this family was obviously far from normal. It does make one wonder if Augusta being paralyzed from the stroke was met with joy instead of sadness by Ed. As now, he took care of her completely and she was dependent on him. Regardless of whether this was the case or not, the next year she did suffer another stroke and passed away shortly afterwards. The death of his mother devastated him, and he channeled this pain by boarding up the rooms in the house that his mother used, and he left them untouched. These rooms included the upstairs, the downstairs parlor, and the living room. Ed then lived in a small room next to the kitchen. Let's step back for a moment. His father died from alcoholism, he most likely killed his brother for talking bad about their mother, and his mother died from two strokes, and he just decided to live in a small room while avoiding the rest of the house. Man, forget Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Make a movie about that, because that is some creepy shit. In 1957, 12 years after his mother died, Ed Gein was arrested for the murder of Bernice Warden. Earlier that morning, Bernice had disappeared. Her son Frank, who was a deputy sheriff, discovered the hardware store that she owned was empty with bloodstains all over the floor, and the last receipt that she had written to was Gein. After he was arrested, they performed a search on his property where they discovered Bernice Warden's decapitated body hanging upside down in a shed. She had been killed with a 22 caliber rifle and mutilated after her death, her body being described as dressed out like a deer. After discovering Bernice, the authorities searched the rest of the house and found some startling discoveries. Okay, let's go through this list real quick. Human bones, human bone fragments, skulls decorating his bedpost, skulls of women, skulls of women's with the top sawn off, skulls turned into bowls, fingernails from human fingers. Oh, but wait, there's more. A waste basket made from human skin, human skin covering chairs, a corset made from the skin of a female, leggings made from the skin from legs, mask made from human skin, a belt made from female nipples, four noses, one pair of lips, a lampshade made from the skin of a face, and fingernails. Oh, but wait, there's more. The face of Mary Hogan in a bag and her skull in a box. Who's Mary Hogan? Well, she was his first victim in 1954, a murder he confessed to, but he was never tried for. Bernice Warden's head was found in the house in a burlap sack, and her heart was found in a plastic bag. But wait, there is still more. Inside of a shoebox, authorities discovered the genitalia of nine females. Alright, what the fuck? See, even though I would never murder someone, in a weird way, I do kind of understand it, and I think a lot of us do. Someone pisses you off enough and you just decide that you would rather they not live anymore. Obviously, it's a horrible thing to do, but in its own weird way it does kind of make sense. But I've never. NEVER! And I mean never. NEVER! Been so mad at anyone, I wanted to turn their face into a lampshade. There's never been a group of people at the mall who have rudely pushed past me and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna turn their nipples into a belt. I've taken my licks into a fight before, but afterwards I shook it off and moved on. I never thought, you know what would look good in a shoebox? Their dick. In a way, you almost have to be impressed with Ed Gein, because when the world handed him lemons, he turned legs into leggings. After he was arrested, Ed admitted to robbing the graves of at least nine people. His reasoning was that after his mother died, he wanted to create a woman's suit so, and okay, this is his fucked up words and not mine, he could become his mother to literally crawl into her skin. Ed fucking Gein, taking the Oedipus complex to an entirely new level. Now, he denied having sex with the bodies as he said they smelled too bad. 
I'm really not even sure how to address this, so I'm moving on. Gein was considered a suspect in missing cases and other unsolved crime in his area of Wisconsin, but nothing really ever came from it. In fact, he was only tried and convicted of one murder, because why would you charge someone for grave robbing, right? You know the real reason he was only tried for one murder? And this is not speculation, this is what actually happened. Prohibitive costs. So in other words, it was too expensive to try him for anything else. Justice is blind, but did you know it's also really fucking frugal? Gein was found unfit for trial in 1957 for reasons of insanity, and he was sent to the Central State Hospital for the Criminally Insane until 1968, where he was deemed fit to finally stand trial. He was found guilty and sent back to the same hospital. It was there he ended up spending the rest of his life until his death in 1984. And just in case you want to visit his house because, you know, people are weird like that, you can't. It was burnt down in 1958 from suspected arson. Today, Ed Gein's not really considered a well-known serial killer, and I use that term loosely. Now, Gein did confess to the murders of Mary Hogan and Bernice Warden, but he was suspected of seven in total, which would make Gein a serial killer if the suspected murders were confirmed. Since they're not, Gein technically isn't a serial killer, as that's defined as a person who has killed three or more people. Whether or not Gein ever earns that moniker, he will be forever remembered as the man who wanted to wear a skin suit of his mother and made nipples into belts. Well, that's it for this video. As always, if you have any suggestions of what you want me to cover, put it down in the comments below, or if you want, you can follow me on Twitter at FakeHistoryTV and send me suggestions on there. As always, please like and subscribe so that way I can grow my channel and so I don't have to work anymore because that's the American dream. Thank you for watching.